Hello. Today we'll just do a brief overview of refeeding syndrome. We tend to see this quite frequently on our service, um, especially when starting TPN. So we'll go through a case, some background on refeeding syndrome, the pathophys, uh, how to diagnose it, and then prevention and management. So we have a 72-year-old. She has recurrent ovarian cancer. She's admitted for a bowel perf. She goes back to the OR for an X-lap and a primary closure of uh, transverse colon perforation, and then she's diverted with a loop ileostomy. So she is on hospital day five, and you plan to start TPN. We um, note that the patient is at increased risk for refeeding syndrome due to a prolonged period of nutritional inadequacy. Um, she hadn't been eating prior to coming to the hospital, and so she's been several days, greater than seven, um, without any uh, nutrition. So a little background on refeeding syndrome, Ansel Keys uh, sought to explore how individuals would be affected um, by a limited diet, and uh, this was called the Minnesota Starvation Experiment. This was in 1944, so 36 men volunteered um, so that researchers can learn how people recover from starvations. So they did three months of a normal diet, which um, is was recorded as 3,200 calories per day, and then six months of semi-starvation, which was basically half of that, 1,570 calories per day. Um, and then they did a rehab, which was a restricted rehab period of um, three months, eating 2,000, 3,000 calories per day. And then eight weeks during which there were no limits. And this was when the first description of refeeding syndrome was noted. So um, there's no commonly accepted definition of refeeding syndrome, and it's often overlooked and underdiagnosed. Um, but the, the best definition I could find was a range of electrolyte alterations occurring as a result of reintroduction of calories after a period of decreased or absent caloric intake. I think we all know from our board studying that the hallmark feature is hypophosphatemia, but you can also see hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, and hypocalcemia. Um, hypophosphatemia, yes, we all know that it's kind of pathognomonic for refeeding syndrome, but some authors in literature suggest that it is the most common abnormality in refeeding syndrome. Um, and what is the importance? Why do we even care about refeeding syndrome? Well, it has increased morbidity and mortality um, whenever someone is diagnosed with refeeding syndrome. So that is exactly why we care. Now to the pathophysiology, which seems to trip everyone up. So we'll try to go through it here. Basically, our bodies need readily available energy to be used. And so when you're starved, these energy stores are depleted. This includes vitamins and micronutrients. And so um, during when you're actually refeeding someone, glucose leads to increased insulin. So here we have glucose entering the body and then your pancreas starts uh, secreting insulin uh, and decreases your secretion of glucagon. And then insulin stimulates glycogen, fat, and protein synthesis. And then this, these processes require several um, minerals and substrates, including phosphate, magnesium, and cofactors such as thiamine. And insulin stimulates the absorption of potassium into cells through a sodium APT, sodium potassium APTase which also transports glucose into cells. So you got a lot of things being shunted into cells, um, including magnesium and phosphate. And then water falls, uh, follows these as well um, because of osmosis. So um, glucose insulin drives electrolytes intracellularly, and this results in a decrease in serum levels of phosphate, potassium, magnesium, all of which are already depleted because of a starved state. So quickly back to the case, uh, we initiated TBN on this hypothetical patient and uh, noted that on that day that the FOS was 3.4, the K was 4.1, the MAG was 1.5, and then the 
the day after TPN was initiated, um, let's say the patient started having maybe some tachycardia and we did some labs and the FOS was 0.7 and the K was 0.33. And so um, if you look, a decrease in any one, two, or three electrolytes by a certain number, so 10 to 20, 20 to 30, or greater than 30, um, that is how you can um, categorize your severity of refeeding syndrome. And, and so in this case, it was approximately a 79% decrease. And so this was a severe case of refeeding syndrome. And so some clinical manifestations that you may see generally within the first 72 hours of initiating TPN or nutrition, um, most commonly tachycardia, tachypnea, peripheral edema. Um, and then you can see several symptoms due to the electrolyte abnormalities that are occurring. So hypophosphatemia, um, you may see more commonly respiratory failure. If you have hypokalemia, um, arrhythmias, and then always remember thiamine, uh, your Wernicke's. Um, another thing of note is that phosphate is uh, one of the main substrates um, required for energy storage in the form of ATP. So um, you can see why that also is extremely important in all our cellular processes because we use ATP in our in everything that we do. Um, so a lot of symptoms, a wide range of symptoms that can occur due to refeeding syndrome. And so the patients at high risk for refeeding syndrome, there's a whole list. Um, you know, most of them are related to um, a status of starvation. Um, but I have a lot of patients that are falling into these categories, oncology, post-op, elderly, um, chronic malnutrition, or these patients who are having bowel obstructions and, um, patients with chemotherapy, but there's a very broad, um, catchment of patients here. So management, um, really the management is monitoring vitals, um, keeping the hydration status um, and fluid retention status at as close to equilibrium as possible. Um, if you notice refeeding syndrome, then the rate of TPN or whatever you're feeding the patient um, should be slowed and electrolytes should be replaced immediately. Um, this is a graph from a nice paper that I cited here that um, goes through kind of all the steps. It go, it's a really nice paper on refeeding syndrome, um, and it's, it mostly talks here in the management about supportive care. So um, again, the definition of refeeding syndrome, and if it's yes, and you have some clinical symptoms, you want to start substituting electrolytes immediately. Oh, sorry about that. Um, if you don't have any clinical symptoms, you can kind of go a little bit slower. Um, sometimes our dietitians like to do Q6 hour labs, um, but you know, talk to your nutrition pharmacy um, people at your hospital to see kind of what their protocols are. This one is saying if they don't have any symptoms every two to three days, um, what which seems um, pretty spaced out to me, but um, talk to your institution. And then the most important thing I would say um, is prevention. So there's no universal recommendation for how to uh, advance a nutritional regimen. Um, but if your patient is at high risk, you should be substituting their electrolytes at, at a lower to normal level. Um, definitely when you're you know starting your TPN, patients need thiamine and multivitamins with that. And um, if they're at high risk, you can start with kind of some reduced caloric targets in a slower rate um, and then increase the full amount over five to 10 days. That'll help prevent refeeding syndrome. Um, talk to your pharmacist dietitian about restricting some fluids and sodium uh, within the first seven days. And then no iron substitution within the first seven days. Um, when I saw this, I was kind of confused as to why that would be on here, but blood production actually requires a very high amount of potassium and so, and hypokalemia will worsen with iron supplementation. So 
Um, avoid any iron if this if your patient is also anemic. Hold off on that. Um, iron can also prolong hypophosphatemia. So um, just a just a tidbit there that I learned that I did not know before. And this is my last slide, but this is my absolute favorite favorite graphic on refeeding syndrome. It just helps me kind of remember what's going on. It's super cute. So this is like us normal. We just have a normal balance of our electrolytes intracellularly and extracellularly. And we have a normal amount of insulin. And then when we're starved, you know, we're, our cells have lost some of the, these electrolytes. And we don't have a lot of insulin around. But then we get fed a piece of bread and glucose spikes insulin drives into the cell we drive all of these electrolytes into the cell and there you have it we don't have a lot extracellularly um, so in summary awareness and risk assessment is key to preventing refeeding syndrome and um, i hope you learned something here if you have any questions leave a comment here are my references have a good day